afternoon. Uh, as Cindy said, my name is Amal Kachavaria. I am the founder or co-founder and CEO of FinTech Portfolio. Uh, and as he said, this program was supposed to be crowdfunding and FinTech related. So I'll cover more of the FinTech aspect of things. I'm sure you've heard from all the other experts about crowdfunding. Um, so let's get started. Uh, in terms of what I wanted to cover today is accelerate your knowledge of FinTech from zero to one, and then do a deep dive on crowdfunding uh, as it relates to various uh, recent raises or uh, somewhat of the most exotic uh, applications of crowdfunding that I've seen to date. And last but not least, I'd, I'd like to give you a little bit of an overview of FinTech portfolio and how our approach to managing risk is slightly different than just a traditional uh, investing in tech startups. So from a professional background, not that it really matters at this point, but uh, I am a FinTech entrepreneur. I've been a FinTech entrepreneur for five years, uh, full time, having uh, needed to go back to any employer. I left a nice hefty paycheck at a small investment management firm, and actually it's the largest one in the world, called BlackRock. Um, so I have, I have worked in both sides of the, uh, the market, the sell side and the buy side of the market. I also happen to have gone to the uh, same business school as our president. Uh, in any event, I'm here to tell you a little bit about financial services innovation uh, in terms of how slow it actually moves. If you can look at the history of financial services, the very first mutual fund was created 90 years ago. And then we have the first credit card, which is actually um, launched 60 years ago. And I apologize for the slide. Maybe we should um, fix them. Uh, give me one second. All right, cool. So I apologize for that. Uh, so 40 years ago, like I said, you know, the first ATM, 60 years ago, the first credit card. Um, and this is the current FinTech landscape. There's over, over 1,500 companies at this point uh, that are trying to disrupt some of the uh, money-making enterprises, you could say, in financial services. So who here can tell me what percentage of the revenues come from lending in a commercial bank? How about you? No? All right. Roughly 70% of the revenues uh, that a, a commercial bank generates comes from lending. And so that's one of the reasons why many people are taking note in the top left corner here, Lending Club, Prosper, SoFi, Common Bond, a lot of the alternative lending marketplaces are bound to disrupt um, that source of revenue. Similarly, if you move to the bottom of that, uh, you have robo-advisors, uh, otherwise known as digital wealth managers. Uh, and you know, there you have companies like Betterment, Wealthfront, <clears throat> which essentially can manage money now for an eighth of what a Merrill Lynch advisor used to charge you. So rather than charging you 2% to manage your money, you can now get an, you know, an optimized portfolio that suits your, um, you know, your goals or your risk tolerance for 0.25%. Right? Um, so those are some of the examples of FinTech or applications of FinTech. If you think of the Valley as well, you know, PayPal was one of the very first um, call it fintech companies in the valley, and that's generated a tremendous amount of wealth in the valley. Is also known as you know the PayPal mafia, right? Which have created now Tesla, uh, Solar City, uh, in mafia in the good sense of the word. <clears throat> um, so I'm not going to cover a lot of these, but just to give you some examples, uh, what were some of the catalysts for change, right? So before Instagram was bought by uh, Facebook, there were many other Instagrams, many other applications that would allow you to take pictures, but really because of the smartphone. Um, you know, in the onset of, of, of the ubiquity, I should say, of the smartphone is one of the major reasons why, uh, you know, it spread like wildfire and why subsequently you had an acquisition. <clears throat> Perhaps one of the most important things that everyone, everyone talks about is millennials and the fact that millennials are uh, digitally native. Um, they rather talk to a computer than a person, and that's fine. <laughs> I've even heard another, I'm not even going to go into the other uh, analogies that people use about millennials. I probably look like a millennial. I'm almost borderline, but uh, we're not talking about my age at this point. Uh, the top right-hand side here is quantified self. So people are now tracking how much they sleep, how much they eat, how much they walk, um, and also how much they spend, right? Uh, applications like Mint have become um, table stakes for people to manage their own money. Bottom right-hand side is probably the biggest change, which was the financial crisis. So there's a huge lost of trust in the industry, um, which has now created or you know an onset basically for uh, fintech. You know people would rather trust a, a an app than a person to manage their money. So the robo advisors are, as I said, you know uh, top left, or top left and actually middle. Um, the big difference between what's on the top is basically you know the ones that mint, you know personal budgeting, personal finance management. Uh, in the center of this is really wealth management. You know charging a fee to manage an account. 
You have companies like Robinhood where you can actually download the app and do your trading for free, literally for free. Um, and I'm not working for them, so. But uh, I think one of the main things that we haven't uh, really talked about in today's conference is the fact that none of these things are an overnight success. And the Jobs Act was passed first into law in 2012. Uh, I happen to have worked uh, at Bankbox and powered you know, the likes of Fundrise, which is having an IPO now, uh, AngelList, and a few of the other uh, better well-known uh, crowdfunding portals, you could say. But uh, you know, as of last year, we really had the onset of Title III. Everybody was waiting for that. So it's not really going to be something that pops exponentially from one year to the other. Uh, Robo-advisors in this case have been around for eight years. Um, there's you know, already some exits like uh, Future Advisor, which got bought out by BlackRock to essentially sell and white label their own platform to the institutional clients that BlackRock had. 70% of their client base is about institutions. Um, LearnVest is another example. Um, that was one of the first, uh, call it financial planning websites that was uh, subscription based and Northwestern Mutual bought them that we were also one of the early investors in that platform. <clears throat> Sorry, the, uh, this keeps on happening for some reason. Um, in any event, uh, 20 years ago was really when the first robo-advisor came into the market. It was called Financial Engines. And it was started by a gentleman by the name of Bill Sharp, which uh, if you ever manage money or if you've ever done any investment analysis, you would know the risk-adjusted returns uh, is, you know, that's an indicator, right? It's, it's, it's the, the Sharp ratio. Um, what am I telling you here at the end of the day? Robo-advisors are all about scale. One million accounts is where... Um, financial engines where, as of 2016, and in terms of the um, you know, assets under management, you're talking about 113 billion. To give you an idea of the sheer size of that, most robos right now have about four and a half billion in assets, even though they've been around for quite a while. All right, so here's an example of where fintech is actually converging. Uh, crowdfunding is definitely uh, something that is going to spread like wildfire. I am biased. I have been working in it since the beginning of the industry. Uh, but I've also started one of the early robo-advisors back in 2011. And uh, I have done um, not only speaking engagements as it relates to robos. I traveled to China um, for, the, for the launch of the very first robo-advisor there by Guanfa Bank last June. Uh, and I've worked with other companies through the Fintech Portfolio Association, uh, such as Huatai Securities, which is the number one bank uh, in the M&A space in China, and number three in terms of assets uh, in China. But the point here is Hedgeable is one example of a robo-advisor that is not offering uh, access to alternatives. So as a perfect conduit to bring to the asset class, in this case crowdfunding, um, investors, eyeballs, uh, lots of the portals that are actually failing out there, they fail because they don't know how to manage money. Okay, here's another example of another robo, Acorns. Uh, who's ever used Acorns here? What can you tell me about Acorns? <laughs> okay, um, in any event, so think of Acorns as a way to roll the change, any, any, any type of purchase that you do, um, the very next dollar is where you round up. And so if you did a purchase for, for $1.50, uh, 50 cents of it will basically be invested. And so it's almost a set it and forget it sort of program. Um, and again, it's just that spare change continues to be invested for every transaction that you do. Alternative lending, on the other hand, uh, again, as I'm trying to pick, you know, paint a picture here as it relates to FinTech, uh, is also not new. Uh, the fact that a lot of the institutional money managers in the top right hand of this slide have pumped a lot of money into the likes of uh, Lending Club and Prosper isn't, uh, isn't an overnight success. You know, Lending Club uh, is already a public company. Prosper is not. Uh, Prosper got in trouble with the regulators, and unfortunately, they um, you know, were shut down for about a year. Um, Prosper is doing extremely well as far as I'm concerned, and I, and I hear from Ram Suber on that. Um, Lending Club, you know, on, on the other hand, definitely has gone through uh, ups and downs as well because they're public and there's a high scrutiny uh, as it relates to you know, returns and other things. But I'm not here to pump any one of these companies. My point, though, is that they're not overnight successes. <clears throat> Similarly, SoFi, you know, even though they have raised over a billion dollars, which is the largest fundraising uh, for a fintech company, uh, and they're only one of the only ones that has actually done a Super Bowl commercial, 
Um, it's only six, six years in the making. Uh, Common Bond, uh, it actually came out of Wharton. I was one of the early advisors at Common Bond before it actually raised capital. On the bottom uh, of the slide here, we're talking about alternative financing at the end of the day. So, you know, whether you're dealing with lending or borrowing for equity or borrowing for debt, um, you know, you still are, you know, a, a source of, of capital that is uh, alternative in nature. <clears throat> so Fundrise um, has been around for about five years. Uh, who here has heard of AngelList? Cool. Who's posted a job on AngelList? Only two. Oh, wow. I uh, highly recommend that you post your jobs on AngelList if you want to find talent that is interested in working in startups or small companies. Um, at FinTech Portfolio, we've found probably about 70% of the people through AngelList and another 30%, I would say, from personal networks. <clears throat> so, SoFi. Um, it also, unfortunately, the slide is not showing this, but um, you'll see that there is not only student lending, but now mortgage lending, credit cards. Uh, it's a full diversified financial services play. It's not no longer just a peer-to-peer -peer type approach. Um, they even have a hedge fund behind it. Here's another example that I'm biased towards, but uh, this is crowdfunding for franchises. Apple Pie Capital. Steve Pelletier, the co-founder of Indiegogo, started this company, uh, and they're doing extremely well. They just raised Series B. Uh, they got published on the Wall Street Journal most recently. And this is essentially uh, the closest thing to having due diligence be leveraged from the fact that a franchisor may not open up the doors to any, uh, anyone who wants to borrow or uh, create a franchise. So the crowd is really leveraging the franchisor as an additional due diligence signal. <clears throat> uh, there's only one more competitor, I believe, in this space. The Dow, who's ever heard of the Dow? One, two, okay. So this is the largest crowdfunding uh, campaign in the history of the world. It was done through digital currency. Uh, and the specific digital currency was the Ethereum uh, digital currency, which is a competitor to Ripple, also a competitor to Bitcoin. Um, the most in interesting thing about the DAO, though, is that it's a decentralized autonomous organization. So there's no CEO, there's no employees, and all they're doing is essentially pooling funds into a fund uh, through Ethereum in order to, to build and, and, and to fund uh, blockchain applications. Similarly, digital currencies. Yeah, go ahead. They recuperated the money afterwards. Yeah, but fair point. There's definitely a risk associated with any of these things. Uh, digital currencies have, uh, have been around for at least nine years now. At least that's when Bitcoin uh, was launched. There is many you know, negative history as it relates to the early applications of, of Bitcoin. Uh, but if you follow the smart money, you'll see that blockchain applications and digital currency investments in general uh, are quite pervasive in terms of uh, VC funds and where they're placing their capital. Um, interestingly enough, here in the bottom left, this is a robocoin. It's basically an ATM that allows you to put fiat currency into, convert fiat currency into digital currency. <clears throat> so if you wanted to build blockchain applications, you can go to BlockCypher, as an example, and tap into their APIs so that you can send money peer-to-peer -peer for free. Payments, I think it's obvious, but now Google, Apple, most of the technology giants are getting into payments. Banking, the whole image of a bank now is changing. Bank of America, for example, has a partnership with the Khan Academy um, to create what they call better money habits. So this is their financial literacy play. Uh, if you look at the bottom left here, it's not about a branch anymore. It's about the branch being converted into a cafe, um, which is, I would say a transformation in the, in, in, in the banking in general. So here's an example of what happens every hour in FinTech. You have about 16 accounts that are open in a robo-advisor that is goal-driven, such as Betterment. You also have uh, 9,000 transactions peer-to-peer -peer through Venmo, which is an app that you can send money to anyone for free. You have um, thousands of transactions also going through Bitcoin. Now you don't have to pay insurance for a whole month. You can actually go to Metro Mile and find, find insurance for one mile buy insurance for one mile, not the whole month. You could also get rewarded because of the whole connected self, connected car, connected home. The insurance companies will actually reward you and give you a cheaper policy if you exercise or if you eat less or if you sleep more. That's called We Savvy. Pretty cool, right? I wouldn't qualify, unfortunately. I didn't sleep much <laughs> last night. <laughs> so what is crowdfunding? I mean, it's pretty obvious. Everybody already told you I'm not going to cover that. So, uh, but. There's an alert. Crowdfunding is actually not new. The very first example of crowdfunding was the Statue of Liberty in the 1800s, where uh, 160,000 people pool funds to, um, to create the last piece of the Statue of Liberty, the pedestal fund. 
Uh, I think everybody understands too that we're dealing with equity and debt crowdfunding here, which is for financial gain. It's not for the t-shirt, it's not for make you feel good. So what's an example of an awesome application that we can see from finance? Uh, Solar City offloaded $2 billion worth of receivables from solar panels and recapitalized by offloading that to the crowd. I think it was a brilliant idea, and that's uh, Elon Musk. Real estate crowdfunding, uh, it's definitely the darling of crowdfunding. I would say it's partially because it's a low yield environment out there, and so you know, it's not really uh, a like for like in terms of risk, but people are chasing yield, and so there's been a lot of uh, diversification that has been done through some, or offered, I should say, through some of these uh, real estate uh, portals. Tesla for the masses, Elio, first Reggae Plus campaign. Tourist attractions are getting crowdfunded now. You have real class action lawsuits, right? So you can invest in the future um, uh, settlement of a, of a class, uh, class action lawsuit. Uh, the Oculus Rift mask, an acquisition of two, two billion that basically created now, why be a, a donor when you can be an owner? Uh, nobody got paid on this deal except for the founders. Uh, at that point in time, this was the largest crowdfunding campaign. Um, you know, it was raised close to 28 million bucks to produce 3D printers. The Jamaican sled team, that was actually donations. <laughs> That's a funny part. Broadway shows. And so there's many, many, many applications. Tom Hanks decided to crowdfund his next movie. I'm not really sure if it actually got done, but Cedars uh, essentially bought uh, Junction Investments as a result of it. Angelus, we can talk about it later on. Foundations are also leveraging crowdfunding. So yeah, I mean, FinTech has a fantastic opportunity, right? There's been $60 billion investing in FinTech since 2010. Uh, but there's also this, lots of companies that go under. And why do these companies go under? Well, quite frankly, it's because 90% uh, of startups anyways fail within five years, and that's because they have limited runway. So here's a chart on the bottom left that basically shows you that 55% of the companies out there would fail if they um, raise less than a million bucks, right? And that's why FinTech portfolio exists. Um, it's out of need. So what is FinTech Portfolio? It's basically crowdsourced talent. We're a community of ex-bankers, asset managers, government officials, um, technology professionals, financial regulators, all pooling forces together to build companies in the FinTech space from scratch. Right? So we're sharing networks, domain expertise, um, you know, resources, again, in a community to foster innovation in the FinTech space uh, by combining or bridging really the gap that exists between the financial institutions and the startups. The startups in this case need a backbone of support around legal, compliance, marketing, engineering. The financial institutions need uh, startups, deal flow, to either partner, acquire, uh, or invest. And so that's why FinTech Portfolio was born. We're based out of San Francisco. And inside of FinTech Portfolio, what we've done is we are trying to provide unlimited runway for our FinTech startups through cash generating businesses. So cash cows in this case, such as the FinTech School, which is the first of its kind, uh, which generates uh, cash on day one, can subsidize the growth of the likes of FundPass in the crowdfunding space, or the likes of uh, BitSmart Loans in the blockchain space. So we have portfolio companies almost in every single one of these FinTech segments. These are just an example of some of our latest partners. IBM, Moody's, and Wharton are partners of the FinTech School, and FundPass just signed a partnership with FundPass. I mean, sorry, Google just signed a partnership with FundPass. Uh, I won't bore you to death with that, but you, know, you can visit fintechschool.com and find you know, our own content on crowdfunding, digital wealth management, blockchain, peer-to-peer. -peer. So now let's talk a little bit about FundPass. Can you fix that? Sorry. So FundPass, and it's not rendering properly here, but what we do is we, now that we all, all understand the rules, right? Um, anyone can raise capital from anyone. And so we provide businesses with two lines of code that enable any website to convert into a crowdfunding portal, which is pretty powerful. Because if you think about it, your own customers at point of sale should be able to invest in you, right? Uh, your own customers have a higher level of due diligence than a random investor. And that's part of the problem I see in the industry is uh, there is a compounded risk. The investor has to trust the due diligence of the portal. The portal has to trust the, uh, the vetting process has to be solid in terms of identifying the best startups. And when you have two, three parties involved, uh, there's time to disintermediate, right? We also power crowdfunding portals, but we also want to enable the small and mid-sized businesses in the U.S. to generate the majority of the jobs to create and raise capital on their own website. So that's what we do. We provide you a Fund Me button. 
when folks are actually clicking on the button, there is a, a, an online investment portal that pops up, and that's right on that same website. So you can convert, again, your own customers, suppliers, friends and family into your own investors. So if you were to say to me, hey, how much do I need to actually uh, ra you know, raise capital or launch my own crowdfunding portal? I'll tell you at least you need a regulator, you need a, a lawyer to look at it, you need a technologist, you need a financier. Uh, chances are you need a lot of money to do it. We package all that up into the two, three lines of code. And then we crunch some numbers. So very similar to the Lending Club model, we're trying, we collect a lot of information on financials. We collect a lot of information that is publicly available about these businesses, such as the EIN number, that can give you the credit worthiness of an established business, right? And then you can determine whether or not it is a, you know, stud or a dud. Our team uh, is extremely strong. We have legal and compliance backgrounds. Brian Castro is unfortunately not here. He is uh, the ex-ombudsman uh, of the SBA, worked under the Obama administration. Uh, similarly, we have Gagan, our chief compliance officer, has done uh, many years of AML um, at places like Schwab and New Resource Bank. Dai Yoshida, our general counsel. Uh, Jim, yeah, he's where, where, 18 years of experience at places like Citigroup. Uh, Solomon Smith Barney, also a war veteran, and he's actually been the evangelist that brought this team together. And yours truly, like I said, I worked at uh, Bankbox, uh, and when I was at Bankbox, I was able to experience roughly 300% growth um, you know, as Title II took off um, between uh, December 2013, um, actually, sorry, yeah, December 2013 until uh, 2014. And as of late, we were the very first uh, portal to receive a uh, approval from FINRA uh, for a Title III portal known as Cusvester, customers turn into investors. And you may say, well, what's next? Now we're gonna dog food our own technology which is a term used for saying, hey, you gotta really uh, walk, the, walk the talk. So we're basically raising capital now in our own website. Uh, we're upon you know, closing basically our first institution around, but we wanna make a tiny sliver of that be accessible to accredited investors. And yeah, I'll finish up with this. Uh, if anybody has any questions around FinTech, I'm happy to, to take any. Uh, but this is what we call the periodic table of social impact for FundPass, which is anyone who has followers, if you're an author, that didn't get published, or you're a game developer, real estate developer, municipality who wants to actually charge uh, or convert their own uh, citizens into re uh, socially responsible investors, you can do that with our own technology here. So the applications are endless, and at the end of the day, what you should think about is, this is a, a, brand, a brand new asset class that has been enabled because of the Jobs Act, but it's not gonna take off uh, you know, one year uh, since the last title was approved. It needs, to, it needs some time to grow. And I think Sydney's doing a fantastic job Coalescing and bringing oh, everybody together. Thank you very together. much. You're very kind. I remember you were uh, in the crowdfunding. You were thanking your last job. When I met you a couple of years ago, we had in conference in Silicon Valley, I think it was 2014. You were with the bank box over there. So you saw in a crowdfunding space, I think bank box was the escrow company at that time, correct? That's right, yeah. We were and the only ones who were able to do programmatic escrows. So you know whether. So you saw you have knowledge about crowdfunding and fintech. What is your output about fintech or crowdfunding other thing? What do you see? I know you're getting to the fintech business. So you're in Silicon Valley. So yeah. just had a question. What, what do you see the outlook? The outlook? Yeah. Uh, I see it very in positive. Um, I think that there's a lot of financial services institutions that are no taking note of the Jobs Act, right? Um, there is plenty of established traditional business models that just need to be brought online rather than just going to chase gold with a brand new, you know, brand new business model with just new technology and new rules, to me, it's you know too much of a compounded risk. If you, so I know. So you do. So if you have any, you saw a lot of companies in a crowdfunding space, yeah. basically or earliest portal. Some of them in business, some of them not. What do, what do you see? I mean, just give us your opinion. I mean, a very honest opinion. What went wrong? What went right? What is going on? Just well, give us your yeah, I mean. I think unfortunately there was a huge hiatus between Title Two and Title Three. Okay. And then we even had a skip to Title Four. I quit my last uh, consulting gig uh, and re repurposed basically my assets to start FundPass uh, as a result of Reg A Plus being approved. And we do have technology that can power a test of water campaign as well, right? Okay. Uh, on anyone's website for that matter. But what, what, what went wrong? I think there is, uh, it's not really uh, fraud, it's really more about do people have the right backgrounds to go raise capital online? Do people understand right. that anyone uh, that looks at a, either a website or otherwise a, an investment due diligence, a curation process, if you're allowed to curate, because not everybody's allowed to curate, uh, do they believe that their money's gonna be safe 
in some regards. There's no guaranteed a return in any of these things, but do you at least believe that the principals of those funding portals have the backgrounds to evaluate some of these companies, right? Uh, also, some of the other portals do not, do not take the necessary steps to verify accreditation or identity uh, or AML. And yeah, I think that there's, there's plenty of opportunity for all of us there. But I do think that the hiatus between Title II and Title III uh, created a lot of uh, dead bodies in the industry, unfortunately. So what are you, what are you for? I mean, I know you just got, the, your company got Rec CF, qualified yeah. for Rec CF. Yeah. So you are in Rec CF. You're believing Rec CF. Well, yeah, we, we have two sides of our business, right? One is the fact that we're a fintech company proper. Okay. And then the other side is that we have a regulated entity under cusvestor.com. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is still this, the same umbrella, but we're going to be separating the two, mm -hmm. uh, probably for obvious reasons. And um, what do I believe about uh, Rec CF? Well, you can, everybody can come up with a website. You can go to Weebly and launch a website tonight. But if you do not have the necessary marketing, uh, you know, engine behind it, if you cannot drum up a crowd, right, you won't be successful at it. Let me ask just the last question I have, then I've got one, we can take one, two questions out of the audience over there because I'm, I appreciate your knowledge. You were in the Thanks. crowdfunding industry and I know you, you were, you know, working with a lot of companies and your knowledge. Um, how, for those people that they want to, you know, uh, get the Rec CF, what's the procedure without getting to the details? Is this hard to get uh, approved yeah. by FINRA and other? I mean, obviously you need to have an attorney and other. Yeah. So what is it? How does how did it take you? It'll take time. And then you... Yeah. So I, I can't thank our co-founder and CEO enough about this because he was very persistent. Um, I was on holiday, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago. And we had to be on the phone with FINRA uh, you know, several occasions. And uh, I think they're being very careful, and, and rightfully so, right? They want to protect the investors, mm -hmm. uh, and that's good. Um, it took anywhere, I would say, at least four months. So and four months. Yeah, at least four months. And you know, the process is very onerous. Sorry? Somebody said something? Is there anybody? Nine months. Nine months? So it's still nine months. Some people had nine months. No, because we, we and originally, and Brian can elaborate on, on that the way they we spoke on the, uh, their conferences that there were 16 when they approved when they were their jobs when when the the first initiative right. i think one of them they dropped one of them it's two i think at least that had been shut down two two has yeah. been shut down yeah so we so were number 22 but it's only 20 operating i believe so they're getting harder with due, due diligence and you know, who they are and other thing about that's why is it yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to speak badly about anything. No, 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 later. without just, naming, without naming. <laughs> it's just very without much a, naming. It's an onerous process, I would say. And we're very lucky to have an ex-FINRA prosecutor in our team. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the fact that we've had plenty of compliance folks, um, you know, who've been very careful with the filings. Uh, but it's not to be taken lightly, right? If your life depends on whether or not you can get approved for a Reg A Plus uh, campaign or whether or not you can get approved for a Reg CF portal, uh, try to find an alternative. You know, Title II still has plenty of deal flow, right? Um, there's plenty of applications yeah, to crowdfunding, yeah. right? Um, and yeah, I think we're just getting started. Uh, okay. The, 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 I think the key thing, though, is that the small and mid-sized enterprises out there still do not understand what crowdfunding is. No. Uh, and so there's a huge level of education that needs to be taking place, but you might as well be early as opposed to five years later when it would not only be saturated, but you would have not had much market share. Okay, so we, we should say a lot of these uh, companies that they're uh, 16, some of them has not done anything, basically. They just have, they've been approved. Some of them did. Some of them, they raise, you know, money, we may raise money in their platform. So it's, and I talked to some of them that raise money. It's, it's not the portal, it's the audience that they brought, the crowd that they brought to the portal. That's very important. So, you know, I mean, just if you build it, they will come, that was not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So you got to have your audience, you have to have your product. You're, if you're in real estate, you, are, you have to bring your invest. And I asked them, I said, how did you guys brought this crowd? Did you market this? They said, no, we went first to our investors, our family, other people. I said, well, instead of giving the money, the checks, go ahead and you know, invest through portal, which is all due diligence, everything right there. Any question? We're going to take one question. We're going to go to the next panel about the marketing. Any question? All right, one question. Can you talk a little bit more about the fintech? Which tech? Sure. I mean, you have Mosaic. You've had uh, established businesses like Palmetto, which launched Palmetto Direct. Uh, I would say Solar City is still clean tech, right? And we gave some examples there. Uh, there were also portals that I saw that um, were, you know, uh, re retrofitting buildings and getting uh, returns or credits from the municipalities that 
where they were operating and passing back some of those uh, efficiencies, not only to the community, but also to the investors. Uh, so there's many applications to cleantech. I think the one, the one of the reasons why cleantech is taking off is because it behaves like a bond. And most of the capital that's committed into crowdfunding, as far as I know, behaves like a bond still. It's like fixed income. Are you talking the financial portal who are involved in the cleantech or the company that are raising get financing of this raising? Yeah, this is strictly um, applications uh, where basically, yeah, cleantech leveraging crowdfunding rules. I see. I see. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.